So good morning and welcome everyone. So I'm Nikolai Kolesnikov and Praveen. We work both at AWS. So today we are excited to talk about, I would not say excited, talk about Cassandra anti-patterns. So we have Cassandra and our agenda today. So um, we have the quick intro in Cassandra common anti-patterns use cases, case studies. So the case studies technically workarounds that I work for the customers. And uh, finally, we will just end with the Q&A session. So um, we are sure many of you <laughs> familiar with Cassandra. <laughs> That's the Cassandra Summit, yeah. Uh, and uh, what I can say, it's highly scalable, wide columnar storage. That's many of my customers using this on a daily basis uh, for some reason. So the first of all, it's no single point of failure. Zero done time, that's what everyone wants. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer distributed architecture. So that allows you to read and write data from the same node. And this definitely adding resiliency with improving performance. So built to handle a massive amount of the data, probably a lot of you use this uh, with terabytes or petabyte storage. Definitely works well. Cassandra's horizontal scaling and straightforward and cost effective approach. So you can easily add more nodes to the cluster. If you want to improve performance so it's linear scalability, it's great. So want to double, just double number of nodes. So um, however, there are some common patterns that we usually observe across our customers um, that can cause performance issues. Today we will explore five such anti-patterns, but the focus only two. We don't have a lot of time to cover all of them. They may be com quite complicated. So are we going to talk about too many tables and large partitions, uh, dive deep? So, but I will just touch a couple of them here. For example, uh, probably fami familiar with the um, Spark usage. So if you have a large cluster and you're trying to, on daily basis, get the data out from Cassandra, read the data, slice and dice, aggregate, and prepare the report, sometimes not failing. So you can see this cluster is in down state, so three, four nodes died in some reason. So, but because the Spark, what is doing, it, it's using the anti, uh, also uh, uh, allow filtering, so it technically scattered, the, scattered together your cluster to get data out. And it's already anti-pattern itself to get data out from the cluster, everything. So for this, uh, there is a Cassandra Enhancement Proposal 20, uh, 28 that's called Reading and Writing Cassandra Data with Sparkball Analytics that allows you to access in Cassandra not from the front, uh, front end directly from the uh, 1942 port. You're going to use just uh, access, direct access to access tables and with the help of it's called uh, the Cassandra sidecar to get data out and process it if at the high speed. Uh, collections, so unfortunately collections is limited. It's not limited, you probably can store up to two gigabytes there, but the performance drastically is going to degradate if you're over 64 kilobytes. And it's reason because it can be sliced, it reads internally, uh, uh, in, entirely, and not be paginated internally. So there is a problem with collections, so keep them small. Uh, now, let's talk about the improvements that we can achieve with the fewer tables. So let's say in case if probably you're familiar with the situation when you have too many tables in your cluster and Cassandra clusters complain you created over 256 or 300 tables already. And from my experience, I've seen the customers that even creating over 300,000 tables. <laughs> so I would like to call upon my colleagues. So Praveen, a stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, and yeah, hey folks. Uh, so let's start diving a little deeper into uh, more specific anti-patterns here. Uh, to like understand what happens with your cluster uh, when you have too many tables, uh, let's take a deeper look into what exactly is happening on the Cassandra service. Uh, so for every table that you have created in your uh, key space, it allocates about uh, roughly about a meg uh, into your heap, uh, JVM heap. Uh, so for example, if you have 1,000 uh, tables in your uh, Cassandra cluster, that's uh, almost a gig of space in your heap that's gone to storing uh, the table metadata. Uh, 
And this portion of your uh, heap is actually scanned on every GC, but never like released. So you're allocating a lot of space, uh, not very efficiently. Uh, and uh, another bottleneck we see uh, when it comes to having too many tables in your cluster is memtable flushing. So as we all know, uh, every mutation in uh, Cassandra is written to your commit log uh, and then is uh, stored in your memtable, which is in memory. Now, when you have multiple tables uh, created, uh, each table has uh, roughly a memtable, uh, which is in your heap uh, by default. There are configurations to store it off heap, but uh, by default, that's the configuration. Uh, the, and the total space allocated in your heap for mem tables is shared across all tables. And what happens when you cross that threshold is it triggers a flush, uh, which is a flush to a disk. There are a couple of bottlenecks that hit there. Uh, there are only uh, two uh, flush writers, uh, which are threads uh, allocated for uh, flushing your mem table to disk. Uh, uh, on Cassandra by default. Uh, you can expand it up to eight, but all tables share this uh, bottleneck, which is a disk I.O. operation, which as we all know it is very slow. And another bottleneck, what uh, what happens when we hit, uh, when we have too many uh, tables in your cluster is uh, we have many tables which have smaller mem tables. Uh, and by default, uh, Cassandra tries to prioritize larger mem tables to be flushed to disk first. Uh, and when you have too many tables, uh, we start fragmenting the space. So you start triggering uh, premature flushes because you're meeting your threshold faster uh, for, uh, and we start triggering multiple disk operations wherein we are flushing smaller fragments of your mem tables because now we have too many tables uh, in your cluster. Uh, another uh, uh, regression that you see uh, when you have too many, uh, too many tables in your cluster is uh, increased pressure on your monitoring stack. And this isn't very Cassandra specific. Uh, it's a common design pattern, uh, design um, thing that we should take into account while designing any large scale system, um, wherein you want to design your metric exporters and disk uh, in such a way that your uh, exporters are able to keep up with the metrics that are being emitted by your service. Uh, Cassandra emits quite a few metrics uh, at the table level. Um, and when you have too many of them, um, it starts imposing a lot of pressure on your monitoring stack. And when your metric exporters are not able to keep up with this, it starts leading to like metrics being dropped on the floor. Uh, and in worst cases, uh, it lets your uh, service fly blind, uh, which as we all know it, like operators hate that, all right? Uh, so uh, there are a few other uh, issues uh, which when you have too many uh, tables. Uh, for example, uh, client drivers uh, during startup uh, retrieve and download uh, table schemas, uh, and this increases your, uh, when, and when you have too many tables, uh, this increases your planned startup time, right? Uh, there's also uh, quite a few uh, shared caches based on implementations, both server side and tables uh, client side, uh, which are shared across tables, uh, so there's some impact on those as well. Uh, now let's try to answer uh, how many tables are too many tables, right? Uh, and this one is, uh, pretty hard one to uh, answer deterministically because it depends on a lot of parameters um, such as the Cassandra version you're running or the specific hardware you have and other configurations, right? Uh, but our load tests do give some uh, pointers. Uh, so for example, this is one of our worst case load tests that we ran. Uh, we ran it against a three node uh, 4.0.11 version of Cassandra. And uh, we allocated, uh, we ran it on uh, T2 XL uh, EC2 machines. Uh, and we simulated uh, a load test using Cassandra stress load test tool, which is packaged with your uh, Cassandra binaries. Uh, and we simulated worst case traffic pattern where our traffic was majorly inserts. Uh, and it was, uh, and the traffic was uniformly distributed across all tables uh, in the cluster. So as you can see here, uh, we see, uh, as we decrease the number of tables in the cluster, we see a linear improvement in uh, write throughput. And a much more significant win is uh, our tail latencies. So we see significant improvement in P99.9 uh, aggregated latency uh, against the number of uh, tables, right? And uh, now let's go into uh, how we can design our systems uh, in a way where we can overcome these, this sort of anti-patterns, right? Uh, 
So one of the recommendations we have uh, when we have like smaller uh, or mid-sized workloads or migrations is to uh, use NoSQL uh, design patterns. Uh, one of the common patterns is to use a single table approach wherein you overload your uh, primary key or clustering key uh, to represent different types of rows or different types of uh, items within the same table that uh, reduces the total number of tables that you have in the system. Another approach, uh, which is actually seen as an anti-pattern in SQL world, but in the NoSQL world, it's fine to do, is denormalization, where you introduce uh, some data duplication, um, but you cut down on the number of tables in your system. Uh, right? A simple example is shown here, where we try to combine uh, two tables into one, um, and we introduce some data duplication due to that. Uh, this sort of design pattern might be hard to put in place or conform when you have larger teams or uh, multi-tenant systems. Uh, and then we have to uh, start thinking a little bigger. Uh, so here we have uh, an abstraction layer uh, built uh, for distributing your actual uh, tables, uh, uh, which is abstracted. Uh, the physical location of these tables on the clusters is abstracted away from client side. Uh, so in this case, for example, we have a routing fleet that sits uh, in front of uh, different Cassandra clusters. Uh, for the client, it is abstracted away and virtually everything looks like it's on the same uh, key space. But physically, uh, the tables are distributed across different clusters uh, and we have routing metadata to support this and help our uh, routing fleet route the connections uh, accordingly. Uh, this sort of architecture helps you scale horizontally uh, because you can add and remove, uh, scale in and scale out your Cassandra clusters in the back end, uh, but completely abstract it away from the client side. However, it comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, for example, uh, one challenge would be how you would ag aggregate system metadata tables uh, for a key space which has uh, tables uh, distributed across different clusters. Uh, in those cases, maybe uh, using uh, managed solutions would be preferred. Uh, now I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Nikolai, Thank to talk you. more about large partitions. So but before I'm going to jump to large partitions, I will add to the uh, previous slide that <clears throat> we usually observe a lot of customers quoting table in the case of engineers, let's say they experience with the MySQL database or any RDBMS system, and they're trying to replicate the same concept of the workload and recreate the same number of tables. Like if you have 100 entities, you'll go and just create 100 tables and they expect it's going to work. Maybe on initial stage when you have little bit data, but after you will see that completely work differently. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about large partitions. From my experience, I, I would select 80% of my customers that I'm working experiencing this issue with large partitions. It's like, it's not as a problem. It may be just the design thinking. So how you initially build your system, you probably don't test well initially, or you probably don't know even uh, enough information about your data geometry. So how the data will look like in the future, how data will be distributed. And if it's small startups, they probably build something quickly and after it will going to grow to something bigger, they will see this issue later. One example here, one the customer is building a system and there is a just the primary key, they decided to use the customer organization ID. And for small customers that are tenants, I would say tenants, they have, let's say maybe private tenants, 10, 15 rows per partition. But after they onboard their, uh, I would say corporate clients, it immediately, they're going to change the structure, but the number of transactions against this key is going to grow and grow very fast. And the problem is going not just to grow like whatever slow I would describe, I would give more proper uh, work for here like a linearly grow or exponential grow. That's dangerous. So, and uh, what we noticed there that sometimes customer, even they building a system and taking into account the large partitions, sometimes they use a select statement without clustering columns. So it's immediately maps everything to the memory when you read and touch multiple SS tables from the storage. So that might be an issue too. Uh, so utilizing identical key that I already mentioned, yeah, they, for example, it's a uh, customer ID or organization ID, something like that you can see in their table. It creates an issue immediately. So and more of it's affecting compaction process because it's taking more throughput to compact large partitions anyway. So, and you will see this is a parameter in Cassandra YAML file that's responsible for uh, threshold here. Um, so my experience suggests that maintaining partitions should be under 10 megabytes. Don't go over 
So 10 megabytes, it's a perfect solution here when you design. Uh, it definitely can help improve the performance of your cluster to a great extent. And you will be able to easily scale Cassandra without surprises. So because it's usually a lot of surprises on the road. So, um, and additionally, so sometimes I see customers using like store some binary workload and the workload itself might be quite large. So let's say 10 megabytes, 15 megabytes, they store images inside or they store some, like uh, let's say uh, some medical information that's uh, uh, usually might be quite large too. So I ended trying to at some point split, but split and not enough that even one megabyte or two megabytes and you don't know how many rows you're going to end this partition. So partition can be easily over 500 megabytes. In my experience, I see the partition at two gigabytes, close to two gigabytes. It's like extremely large and the customers ask us to help to redesign complete solution and move to the new schema. So, um, and if you have a large payload, maybe sometimes you have to think about maybe it's not the right place to store this large payload in Cassandra. Think about something different. Maybe it will be memory solution that close to, uh, uh, to, to Cassandra or it's uh, some maybe object storage that you're going to choose to store the object and store just a reference link to, you know, to your object inside your table. So, uh, uh, case study one. So yeah, so, kissed, kissed. so the four small customers, uh, like mid-sized clusters, when they have one application per cluster, it's, we can easily just redesign it. So there's not, not a lot of efforts there. And usually you can find a low-hanging fruit there, especially in, regular, in the regular columns, you can bring to partition key. Or sometimes you can look into and say, okay, in the clustering columns, if I move the clustering column directly to partition, it will improve some uh, distribu data, data distribution there, split the partitions on the smaller uh, parts, and you can easily make an easy improvement without like <laughs> hurting overall like infrastructure. So yeah, we can go next. Uh, so key study two. So we have a customer that use Cassandra in a way where it's, it's only one large cluster. So it's a shared cluster that a lot of applications there. So it's not only one or three, it may be 100 applications there. And they might affect each other because they just use large partitions there. Uh, and um, uh, more, moreover, they just figure it out. Okay, we create something. We create something and uh, we didn't know that it actually is going to affect the overall performance, but at the later it's affecting all your applications. Your all, all applications start slowing down because it's on one application hurting everything. So one approach here is to build a unified data storage on top of Cassandra that allows you to store data in a unified format. In this case, your primary key will look like unified, so it will be the same. It will be prefixed with a bucketing, like a bucket, uh, bucket ID or something like that that you can use, uh, where the each bucket technically might be stored in, in different clusters. So you have a fleet of different clusters where you can split uh, these buckets and store them across different clusters. And I will just reuse the same architecture that previously mentioned by Praveen here. So by just adding additional bucket there. So the bucket store multiple partitions, but bucket should have a limit. So it's limit how many partitions it can store at what size. In this case, the cluster should automatically split a new bucket and uh, your workflow can go directly from the fleet to, uh, to proper cluster. So um, uh, let's conclude here. Um, so my recommendations here and the previous recommendation would be to keep the number of tables low. So keep them under 200, don't go over. So I, I think the most products that you can find right now, even it's data stack server of its Cassandra, it's automatically complaining about that you exceeded the number of tables. And it still state if you read into 56, it's complaints, it's give you a warning and after it just fails after 512. It will be failures. Um, use guardrails, it's a nice new feature in Cassandra 4 that you can find Cassandra 4.1. You can set the number of tables that you allow to create in the cluster. So it's a, it's a good way to manage the number of tables. And uh, aim to keep the same size of partition under like a 10, 10 megabytes, don't go over. And uh, test your workload. So use the tools, so frameworks that are available. Uh, for, for example, out of the box, Cassandra stress tool. 
perfect tool. Even if people don't like this, I like it, <laughs> and I continue to use it. So another available tool P stress test that's uh, developed by the, the last pickled. Uh, so another tool that you can use, NoSQL bench. And sometimes I like to use the tool that's called Locust. I don't know if you're familiar with Locust. So the Locust is another test framework that allows you to imitate your like a real workload with HTTP requests. So it will be look like you have real cluster that's attacking your Cassandra. See, that's how it's going. So and it's easy to write because it's just a plain Python. It's easy to deploy quickly or you can use scale so you can uh, produce a million transactions per second there. So it uses uh, uh, distributed architecture too to just create a workload. So for the large partitions, you can actually use uh, node tool stats, table stats to ident identify them, or you can use the virtual tables. And virtual tables, this, the statistics are available. Just look at there, so you will find your largest partition there for each table. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, if anyone has questions, we would be more yeah. to happy answer them. Uh, and afterwards, you can find us here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Someone has a question. Yeah, so. Yeah, we can hear you. I would not say anti-big pattern, so, but it's anti-pattern so still. Anti -pattern. Mm -hmm. So have you seen any use cases where a standard table might have a lot of columns, say 3,000 or 5,000 columns, but it, 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 in the end the, the partition size is big. Let's say it stays under 10 megabytes, but 5,000 columns and the columns are getting updated frequently or mm -hmm. added to it. Is, would you consider that an anti-pattern? Uh, I've seen this couple patterns that you mentioned right now. So what we usually recommend, we switch from to have a lot of your columns in a way that's horizontal, it's a separate column there, to uh, maybe sometimes we compress the value inside. So if we see that, for example, if they store a JSON or something like that, and change it from uh, just like a row in a partition so what I mean? So you have a column there, but now it's just a row with partition with specific column that says, this is like key value, like a key value pairs. And plus you can add the sharding value there so you can sp still split them. But the problem here, you need to keep on this uh, splitting number. So when you're trying to read everything, so where the data should store, it should store an application site, application should not upfront. So this partition stores, let's say five buckets and read it back so it will read each bucket by one one. Yeah, so that's, you can technically from the, this representation go like this in partition and split the partitions. So is it recommended inside the large column tests to make it a single partition or not? So you can, might have a lot of columns, but if it's not affecting the size. Of the partition. Yeah, so that will be fine. Uh, then again, it is the partition size that will Yeah, the partition it will be available because I've seen like a four or five thousand even columns, so a lot. And it's afterward just affecting the size of the partition. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I will, uh, before we wrap up, uh, here are some other events uh, coming up to we think you might be interested in. Uh, we have a workshop uh, and AWS dinner there, so we have a booth uh, and other sessions. So we look forward to seeing you there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ah. Can take yeah. Yeah. So in this case, what kind of pattern would Store you somewhere there. So you can have another storage, just a link. Your, uh, yeah. your table will be just a ledger for yeah. your artifacts, but this large artifacts will store in different storage. For example, Redis uh, can uh, store up to 512 megabytes in memory. You can have the object. If your performance is an important part of you, like it should be milliseconds, you can store the object there, but the reference you will store in Cassandra, and you can quickly get the data out by the reference. Yeah, use more, Cassandra is more like a data pointer. Uh, to it's like the main, it's your, your, your main ledger, you store yeah. your data there, but the objects, large objects, it stores somewhere different place. Yeah. Uh, it, for it, example, it, Redis, it might be Redis. Yeah. You actually, it's memory, right? yeah, it's a memory solution. 
You can. Yeah, I recommend you put in a, even in a, mm -hmm. yeah. multi fetch pattern. Yeah. So uh, about multi fetch pattern here, you can use uh, if you use a Java. So the driver has a custom uh, custom codex. You can develop your codex that behind the scene you looks like you're querying the Cassandra table, but behind the scene. It takes the link and make a request to a different uh, storage and return data. You will see this. It return you back the normal result. But the data stored in different place. But you can mimic this behavior easily with uh, uh, data stacks, uh, custom codex. It works well. I tested. I didn't test this for super large objects like that's 100 megabytes. I tested this for 1 meg, 10 meg objects. And it perfectly works with the custom codec. That covers this, and usually developers don't see it, so they just use it as standard, like a select statement from table. You have a prepared statement, and it will return you uh, the large object back, even if it's not inside Cassandra. Right. So, yeah, I know this is not like this, this section, but with the uh, Cassandra file, I mean, I mean, with iOS I/O, so you won't need this kind of loop over anymore. You can create a thing that you can only do. So regarding to five, uh, I don't have a lot of information. So, but I probably you can ask the session will be probably next. Uh, here's the one of the presenter from uh, data stacks. Uh, they can probably answer this question regarding to if it's able to support. Yeah. It. yeah. Because you can easily split when you have a partition, so you can split the partition. You can add a bucketing value, so prefix your every key. So let's say you have a one million rows, and you're trying to store this one million rows inside the one partition, not like this, not like in a horizontal way, yeah, like the yeah. columns. So in this case, you can define, so you store per partition 1,000, so you will assign a bucket, so that each bucket you know start 1,000 queries. And you know upfront so how, how many buckets you have. So when you query, it will provide to your query, supply your query with the bucket ID to get data back. You know the data stored there. You can use a hashing techniques. You can have a hashing algorithms to figure it out, the bucket ID. Because if you hash your primary key, it will give you anyway the number of the bucket that stores this data. And you will prefix when you get I would recommend to go in the way to store this inside the partition and split the partition. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it will put some pressure uh, either on the client side or you can uh, push that pressure to your routing fleet if you have another abstraction layer. And you can do something more intelligent there uh, based on the queries that you're doing uh, to only set up connections uh, only when needed, uh, right? Uh, for example, maybe something that's aggregated across clusters needs to set up the uh, connection. Otherwise, we can have the uh, connection set up more focused. So that uh, for the client side, it will still look like a singular one, but you can abstract the complication out. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.